So hello, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we want to welcome you to introduce yourself in the chat box. Tell us who you are, if you want to, and uh, the grade or the subject where you teach. One of the questions we had asked um, as part of the registration was sort of the environment in which you teach, if it's rural or suburban or urban area. So that would be fun to also know about you in this moment. And if you want to share the school or the program where you work, we'd be glad to know that as well. And anything else, if you have a fabulous moment from your day you want to share with people, um, you're welcome to. And my name is Liza Lowe, and I'm affiliate faculty at Antioch University here in Key, New Hampshire, which is the unceded land of the Abenaki people or Abenaki people. Um, and I am also the director of Inside Outside, which is our um, professional network for nature-based educators or place-based educators or outdoor educators. Um, however you identify, we're just, we are working to support you and get resources to you and offer opportunities like this. And so we are super grateful from, for the George B. Storer Foundation, which um, gives Antioch funding to do certain things like this that are free to you. So thank you for showing up this evening. And I'll throw some links in the chat box so you can find out more about Antioch and the programs that we have. We have a nature-based certificate program, a place-based certificate program, and other um, wonderful opportunities for educators. And I'll also throw in the chat some information about Inside Outside so you can join us if you want to. We have uh, local chapters all around um, the United States. And well, let me just see if I have, oh, okay. So here's more about Inside Outside. Oh, we have um, a calendar on our website where you can find out about different events uh, and sign up on that from that calendar. There are links to register for the events. And then also we have a YouTube channel. So this webinar, tonight's webinar is being recorded. And in the next couple of days, I'll get it up on the YouTube channel so you can watch it, share it with your colleagues and friends. And also just these are um, some examples of resources that are on our website, information about social justice as related to nature-based education, position statements, um, uh, different resources, thinking about how to get outside in, in throughout the different seasons. Okay, and again, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat so you can learn how to join us. And um, just lots of free opportunities. And without further ado, um, because the reason why we are here this evening is to hear from Rachel. And I just wanted to share that I first learned about Rachel um, the first year of the pandemic when I decided to homeschool my own kids so they could be outside instead of needing to learn online. And I came across Rachel's um, homeschool curriculum and we used the math curriculum. And forevermore, I've been uh, super into it and taking it and using it with teachers I work with. And then when I saw that she was writing a book, I thought, oh my gosh, this is this is what we need for those, you know, we've been so focused on early childhood education, which has been really important. But um, the book that Rachel's writing is what we need for our elementary teachers and our middle school teachers and even our high school teachers. So um, I'll let Rachel introduce herself further, and I'm going to put a link in the chat so people can pre-order a copy of her book. Thanks so much, Rachel, for being here this evening. Well, I'm so excited to be here because I love talking about outdoor learning and especially um, outdoor learning at the elementary level, which is what I'm really passionate about, um, and particularly uh, integrating those academics. And I do see a few um, familiar names. So that's kind of exciting people that, that I've gotten to know. And um, I'm going to share my screen. And so then you can see what I'm doing here. And it takes a minute. We learn this. It takes a minute. You can see it now. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So I'm Rachel, Learn Rachel Tidd, and I run Wild Learning, which uh, encompasses wild math, wild reading, and now the new book, Wild Learning, Practical Ideas to Bring Teaching Outdoors. And I have a bunch of pictures and lots of ideas um, from the book, from the curriculum, kind of a combination. Um, and I'm hoping that you get some ideas and spark some things to do maybe in your classrooms. Um, so I have a little bit of a, I like to do a learning path because I like to know where I'm going. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about who I am, why the heck I'm here, um, why I focus on academics, um, 
the way I kind of think about this is zones of accessibility, and I'll explain that more. Um, and then the, the nitty gritty of what does this look like? Um, strategies, examples, activities, and then we're hoping that you will have uh, some questions that we can try to answer um, or start to answer even together. Um, and so that's that's the plan. So I want to um, acknowledge um, that I live in Ithaca, New York, which is the unceded territory of the Gayakono, which is also known as the Cayuga Nation, and it's part of the, of the Haudenosaunee, which is also the Iroquois. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge, acknowledge their stewardship of this place um, in the past and the present, and I encourage you to find out um, about the land where you live and the indigenous people um, whose right it is to um, to it. So there's a link there if you're more if you're interested. Um, so I want to talk about me. I'm Rachel. So just in case you've never heard of me, um, I am many things, I guess. Uh, one of them is I am the author of this book right here called Wild Learning Practical Ideas to Bring Teaching Outdoors, as well as Wild Math and Wild Reading. I was a special education teacher for several years. Um, I taught mostly for first through sixth grades, kind of all over there, um, most recently first grade, and um, I'm also the parent of a 10 and a 13 year old, and um, they are the reason I am here because I sent them both, both to forest preschool, and they both thrived, and my youngest in particular um, had a lot of sensory issues and uh, had no issues in Forest preschool. And that got me really thinking as a special educator, as a parent, you can't go to preschool forever. Um, how are, how am I going to teach this child to read and do math and to write? And I had to integrate the outdoors into doing that. And that kind of led me down this path. And that led me down to writing wild math and then wild reading. And that is how it all unfolded, believe it or not. Um, yeah, so I'm going to keep going now. So I mentioned this before. So in the book, Wild Learning, I uh, introduce and organize um, the activities by the zones of accessibility. And I like to think of it this way because I'm thinking in terms of a teacher. And the easiest thing I can access for outdoor learning is often the schoolyard. And this also goes for urban areas. I know I taught at schools with rooftop playgrounds where they closed off the street because they didn't have a place to play and they actually played in the street. Um, so all of those places count and all of those places are great places to learn um, and they're the easiest. The next kind of realm circle is the neighborhood. And um, a lot of people sometimes miss this. Um, they get either stuck in the schoolyard or they get stuck that you have to go outside like farther, like to a park or, uh, a major field trip, um, but the neighborhood holds so much learning opportunity and real life context for math and reading in particular, and I'm going to talk about that today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about farther afield, um, but I feel like that's the more common way people think of uh, outdoor learning, and so um, I have a couple examples, but and then my final chapter that I'm not really talking about today is bringing nature into the classroom. And that is a whole chapter in the book if you're interested in that. Um, I will say about the book, I when I, that I started talking to the publisher about writing it, I was very adamant that this could not be a book that was just about theoretically learning outside um, and leaving teachers to just kind of make up their own activities. Um, and it couldn't be like a whole nother thing for them to fit in their day. Um, they originally kind of had, a, had this envision, this book that was just, I don't know, more like philosophical or something. And I was like, no, 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 we do not need another one of those books. Um, and so I was really adamant that if I was gonna write the book that it had to be this more practical and that's why practical is in the title. All right, so here are the three uh, accessibility zones, schoolyard, neighborhood, and further afield. Like we said, schoolyard is easy to access, no special permission, no 
field trip permission forms, and you do not need a leafy green space. You do not need a fancy garden. You do not need anything except outside and maybe a few materials, which we'll talk about. And then there's the neighborhood. Um, you know, and I said that they can provide real life learning opportunities. I'm going to show you those too. I'm really excited. And then farther afield, and I'm going to talk about this too, but I, I just want to um, emphasize that um, learning further afield and the neighborhood can help build kids background knowledge. And this is especially important for kids that don't always have those opportunities and don't um, haven't been very many places. And you cannot comprehend text without background knowledge. The research is very um, becoming very clear about this. And so the more experiences we have, as well as learning opportunities, combine and build on each other. And so we can kind of link this outdoor learning to that bigger idea. Um, so why do I focus on math and reading? I'm a little bit of a, sometimes I describe myself as a unicorn because most outdoor learning is very environmental based or science based. Um, but I really think of myself as kind of like the first, the first step because kids really need to learn how to read and do math before they can really tackle some of the bigger projects or problems. Um, and in life, they need those basic skills. So if we can figure out how to kind of meld the two, um, we can really get a lot of bang for our buck. We get to go outside and we're learning basic skills. It's great. Um, and then the majority of instruction, whether you homeschool, whether you are a teacher, um, the majority of our time is spent on math and reading instruction. Usually science is pushed to the last. It's like 40 minutes maybe a couple of times a week, maybe more if you really um, do well with integrating it. Um, but if we're going to get outside more than just once in a while with our kids um, and make it more of a regular thing, we have to capitalize on those math and reading minutes. And we have to um, show administrators that we can teach those things, same skills outside. Um, and then I, I kind of touched upon this, that it's not another thing. Um, I really tried to focus on things and strategies and concepts that are already in our curriculums um, that everyone teaches um, so that it's not another thing to fit in your day and you can just kind of match it up with um, what's in your curriculum and transfer it over. Um, and by the way, that was a those are two 10 frames on cloth. That's a fancy one. You can make one with just a regular piece of fabric and a permanent marker. It does not have to be beautiful, um, but that's just, I just wanted to explain what that was because some people are like, it has to be beautiful, but it doesn't have to be beautiful. Um, so the schoolyard, um, and when I think of the schoolyard, I immediately think of these kind of things. So I wrote them down. Um, chalk, one of my favorite, most accessible materials that you can use in the schoolyard, almost any schoolyard I've ever seen has a place where you can use chalk, whether it's the wall or pavement, et cetera. And you can use it for math. You can use it for reading. It's amazing. Um, natural materials. If you do not have natural materials, you can bring them into your space. Um, you can have the kids help you with this. You can go on a walking field trip to collect materials and try to pick materials that are plentiful. After you're done using the materials, you can return them. To... I'm a starving one. Someone's not muted. Um, and it can just, you know, you can bring them inside. You can keep them in containers. Um, you can leave them out and see how it goes. But um, that's a little, some places have them, some places don't, but you can always bring them in. Games, reading outside. I know this seems really obvious, right? Reading outside, read alouds. But what I wanted to emphasize is if you mesh it with a time that you might already be outside, like recess, um, instead of going in right away, maybe you keep your class out. And that way you gain that transition time. Um, and it makes it a little, extends the time outside. When I taught sixth grade, we would come in from recess and um, they would read silently. Um, but we could have read, and we did sometimes, that independent out, independent reading outdoors. Um, so it's just the thought and thinking about how to structure your day to get a little bit more time out there. Um, and utilizing the playground, there's a lot of ways in the book of how I utilize the playground with scavenger hunts and shapes and area and volume. 
um, so that thinking about how you can use that. So here is my chalk, um, math and chalk. And I just wanted to throw some examples to kind of illustrate it. Here is um, a really big 10 frame. And inside you will see the bundles of sticks. And those bundles are um, place value sticks and they're bundles of 10. And I use these instead of um, the base 10 blocks that are so common in classrooms. Um, and if you use these, and I do talk about this, I really want you to have the kids make these a set of 100 or 120 sticks um, because that's where there's so much learning happening. They have to keep track. They have to group them. They have to organize. They have to keep counting to know how many they have and how many more they need. And there's so much into that. And if we do that for them, then they're missing that opportunity. And I always like to point that out because teachers and parents love to like prepare. And that's kind of part of the preparing, you know, gathering the sticks and making it all. And then they're more invested in the material as well. Um, on the bottom is a 10 frame just written on a rock. Um, if you don't have a lot of paved surfaces, think about other surfaces you can draw on. Um, and those are plastic, just those plastic magnetic letters, which are great for winter, wet. Um, I have other ones, but the plastic ones kind of are, they never die. I don't know. They're great. Um, in the middle, I have number bonds, which are another really common way to teach addition and add-ins. And um, I made the bonds with sticks, and then these are rocks. And I used to, and I have this in the chalk because I wanted to point out, I used to uh, say to paint the numbers on like with a paint marker. Um, but now I really, I recommend using chalk because it's more flexible and you're not searching for numbers. You can write a double digit number like 14 or 114, and then you can just erase it and write a new number. And it, it's just a little more efficient and faster and less clunky. Um, I do still write out the letters, but I have multiple letters and they're kind of organized in like plastic craft kits. Um, you can see pictures of them on my Instagram, which I'll share at the end. And then on the side is a, this is a, a class we were working on multiplication and every kid wrote two multiples of six and we wrote them in order. And then they went through and they were, I have a video of this. They were like shouting and counting and jumping. And then they'd loop around and they got really into this and really loud. And that was fine because we were outside. Um, Cause the rules, as soon as you go outside are a little more relaxed than when you're in the classroom. Another really great um, thing that translates um, outside into the schoolyard really easily is number lines. And there's so many different number lines and ways you can use them. And they go all the way up to, you know, fifth and sixth grade or even higher. Um, you can have a regular number line on a, like a clothesline and just have um, one through 10. Um, or this is, this is an example of a fraction and decibel number line. So this time the line is a stick, um, also makes a great number line. And I gave the student cards and they are um, estimating where those fractions go. I think it's like zero to one. And there's also some decimals in there. So there's some that are like one half and there's some that are like 0.5. And, you know, there's some equivalent fractions and they kind of have to like put them all where they go. And if they're equivalent, they have to put them, you know, kind of next to each, like underneath. So it's like a row. Um, but this is a really, number lines have been shown to really help kids understand fractions and understand where benchmark fractions are, like a half and like a quarter. Um, and that can really help them in their overall fractional understanding. And so using number lines is a great way to do that. Um, the bottom is an open number line. This might be new to some people. Um, it's a really great tool for teaching, um, adding and subtracting double digit numbers um, in a way that makes more sense, like conceptually that we're adding tens and then the ones. Um, I have a whole video about open number lines. I might have more than one um, on my YouTube channel and on Instagram. Um, I just think they're really fun. And I wish I had been taught them when I was a kid because um, it really just makes so much sense and it's quicker than it looks. Um, so yeah, if they're new to you, definitely check those out. Um, and then hundreds charts, everyone has hundreds charts these days, right? Well, we can use them outside. 
collecting 100 items. You can play with dice and play, you know, race to 100. Um, you can add and subtract using what I usually call the paper calculator when it's paper, but you can just call it the hundreds chart calculator if you're outside and it's not paper. Um, some people draw big ones with chalk. Um, there's tons of ways to use the hundreds chart. Um, it's a great tool inside or out. Um, and then natural manipulatives, I just wanted to point out that you can bring them inside, you can use them outside, and kids love, I mean, these are horse chestnuts, and they have this, like, amazing, like, texture that just, the like, kids are, it's irresistible, and so a lot of the times when we're changing up our manipulatives with natural materials and different ones, and we're rotating, we're igniting new interest in our same lessons, so it's fun to do. Um, phonics and reading are very near and dear to my heart. I love to teach reading and I'm very into the science of reading. If you have been in on that new debate, um, I don't know. Um, so I try to integrate a lot of examples of this and in my wild reading curriculum, um, so this on the left over here is word squares, and these are great to do with chalk. Um, so basically you put a sound like a, this is a vowel team EA in the middle, and then you put consonants around the end or blends or, you know, or digraphs, and they have to make as many words as they can. They can write them in chalk, they can write them on paper, you can write real words and nonsense words. Um, they can make up some and then get that you can do it with prefixes and suffixes. Um, I have a bunch of options in the book. And then Elkonin boxes, also called sound boxes. These are really helpful to kids with dyslexia as well as all kids learning to read. Um, basically each box can be one sound. So if you have a digraph like SH, that would be in one box. But if you had BL, that would be two boxes. So um, this is mad. Um, and it just helps kids break words up into their component parts and blend them together. It helps their spelling, um, it helps them hear those sounds um, and their phonemic awareness. So I, if you haven't tried that as a strategy, it's a great one to try and easily done with chalk. You can also do it with um, rock number and letters or plastic letters in there um, if you want to take that writing component out. And then leaves, leaves are like free and they're like everywhere in the fall when we're starting school. Um, you know, you can pick up a hundred leaves in like five seconds on the way to school if you don't have any in your yard. I am totally that person on a walk collecting leaves. I think people think I'm nuts when I'm like, oh, that's a great one. And I'm like out in front of their yard and like, these are great. These are like a good example of this kind of leaf. Um, but you can do all kinds of things. And the key here is permanent markers. Um, you can write on leaves with permanent markers so well. And so here is how I was uh, teaching uh, silent E with, in adding the suffix ing. Um, because you drop the E and add ING, that you probably under, remember, right? Um, and then you can just cover the leaf and the E up and have them write it or write it in a sentence or um, cut off the E and put it together, whatever um, you wanna do. Syllable division is another fun thing. Um, these are, um, we might recognize those as compound words, a lot of them, but um, they, they like to teach syllable division now by syllable types and patterns. And so this is the vowel consonant consonant vowel pattern and you split between the two consonants. So like an upset, you have a vowel consonant consonant vowel and you split between those consonants. So you literally can cut them with your scissors when they're a leaf and you can put them together, take them apart, mix them up, whatever you wanna do. Um, but kids love that they can just cut them. Yes, you could do this inside with paper, Sure, um, but you can also do it outside. Um, and then the bottom is marking up words where we teach kids um, how to um, mark up words to show their components. Um, so a long vowel A is a line above the top and with a silent E, you cross out the E to show that it's silent. Usually you do it on paper, but you can also do it with natural materials. These are um, rocks that I just used uh, 
permanent marker to write the consonants and vowels on. And I choose usually to make my vowels a red color so that they kind of stick out so that every word has a vowel. Uh, just a, a side note there. Um, and now to the neighborhood. I know I'm talking fast, but I wanna make sure you get to see all the pictures and we have time for credit or questions. So be thinking of your questions. Um, so I love to do walks. It's one of my favorite things because every time you go for a walk, you notice something different. You can give them different tasks. You can have different assignments or activities that you're planning to do. And they're super simple, take very little planning. And all you have to do is get out the door. Um, environmental print and numbers in the neighborhood is like gold. There you are looking at numbers and um, words in context, not on a worksheet, not up on the board, not on the smart board. Like this is like in real life. It is conveying a real message, whether it's a parking sign or an emergency sign or, you know, the title of a, a building. It's real life reading and examples, and you can really leverage that because kids are interested and they want to know what it says. Um, street trees are underutilized, and I have a lot about using street trees. Um, a lot of people don't realize that street trees, especially in larger cities, are like managed by a city forester. Um, we have one here in Ithaca, and I went on a street tree tour. And it was amazing. And they know every tree and all about them. And they would love to come to your class and tell you about them. And the thing about a street tree is that you can visit it and um, you don't have to go to a special field trip. You can visit that same tree over and over and over and it's close by to your school. And so um, it's a great way to watch something over time. And I have a writing assignment that I like to do. And then of course our neighborhood increases our sense of place. It gives kids um, an idea of their community and why it's important. And um, it really just helps them feel pride and a connection, which in turn helps them be better, better stewards of their place and their world. So think about that. So here's a fantastic picture of something you might see. This is a street sign. Um, that I took a picture of and I just started brainstorming some things that you could do if you saw a sign like this, because everyone sees signs like this on their street. Um, and so I was like, well, you could mark up some of these really interesting words like limit and minute and reserved. Um, reserved has an ED on it. There's three sounds to ED. So you could talk about that. You could link it to math. How many cars can park here in two hours? In 24. So there's two parking spots there. One's a 15 minute parking spot and one's a two hour limit parking spot. So you can go either way. Um, the ED and the e ING suffixes are both re represented on this. So if you had done a lesson, oh, we have a truck going by. Um, if you had done a lesson on ED and ING, um, you could then go on a walk looking for ED and ING. This also has the word two on it, and it could be a good time to talk about um, why the word two has a silent uh, W in it and how that is linked to Old English and all words that have to do with the number two where the W is pronounced like twin and twice and 12, 20, because um, 20 is two tens and 12 is 10 and two. Um, and then you could also expand it to a writing assignment, like um, what would happen after the car was parked here for two minutes? Did a police officer come by and give a ticket? Did Superman come and remove it? Um, it could be really anything um, and they could get really creative. Something really crazy could come by or, um, you know, like, I don't know, a gorilla came and sat on the car and refused to move. I'm not sure, but something could happen um, and they're going to tell you. So that's just one sign and all of your options. Um, I wanted to show you some walks that I have done with kids. And so I have two multiplication walks. Um, this multiplication walk, we were looking for things that um, came in groups. And that first picture that I showed on my first slide was me like looking at some flowers. That was from this walk. And um, we were looking for all things that came in groups. And first we divided our paper up and we wrote the two, three, four, five, six, because that's what we were skip counting and practicing. And then we kind of brainstormed some things that we could think of that came in those like two eyes, clover, poison ivy. And then we went out and we walked around and we looked for things. And then kids either drew or they wrote 
um, what they saw. So we've got like some cats here. And we have a lot of cats, cats and dogs. We have five points on maple leaves. We have some windows. Um, there's a lot of cats, cat's eyes. I mean, they love the cats, so it's fine. Um, here I have a chestnut leaflet. You know, it comes in five. Um, we just saw lots of things. And once they, they get so excited, they start seeing things everywhere and um, they get really engaged. And I had some parents with me on this and they were just like, couldn't believe how excited the kids were and were thanking me for bringing them outside. It was a beautiful day. Um, and so we also did this with a race. So we were deep into our multiplication and we went out looking for a raise and just like things that come in groups, maybe even more so, you will find arrays everywhere in the neighborhood. I will say that arrays are much easier to find in a human made environment um, than nature. I think you can find things that come in groups in nature, but arrays are a little harder because it's kind of constructed by humans, but they are everywhere. Um, so we have like a grate on a window, we have buildings, we have a storm drain. And then this one over here, the kids were fascinated with. All it is, is um, it's like, right before a crosswalk and um it's really big and that's why they thought it was really cool because they were trying to figure out how many were in there but it was like beyond their just on the side of the street figure this out so we counted the rows and the columns and we wrote it down it was too big for our graph paper so what they were doing is every time they found an array they drew the array on their paper and figured out how many um squares were there and um but this was too big for our graph paper so we wrote it down and then we went back and we got bigger better graph paper with smaller squares and we were able to break it down into parts which is kind of a lesson in itself um you know you can do 10 by 10 and that's 100 and you don't have to count everyone and, and then you can do like two by four, you know two by ten or whatever um and so we were able to figure out how many dots there were on that one but i did have to stand this is me i was standing so that they wouldn't go into the street i'm sure the cars really appreciated that um that i had kids like right next to the street but this um, are some just a couple other ideas to think about in your neighborhood um, in the resources that you could. Andrew from the Brooklyn New School, let me use some photos of his amazing bridge study um, in New York City. And people don't think about like bridges are really interesting. There's a lot of really interesting things in all communities, bridges, historic buildings, historic trees, um, monuments, graffiti, murals. Think about what you have and leverage it for uh, a, a unit. Um, this is the middle is an example of my street trees. So they made a book and they observed the tree in every season. And then they wrote about their observations for each one and put it together at the end and made a book. And then cemeteries, anyone? <laughs> um, we have had a lot of fun in cemeteries because they have... Um, a lot of print they have history they have numbers they have like dates which are big numbers and and you can find the oldest gravestone and then the newest gravestone and when were most people here buried and who are some of these people you can really go down some rabbit holes um but there's tons of words and um and numbers too so think about those. And then finally, farther afield, um, we talked about how it can increase background knowledge. Um, a lot of kids, um, most of their exposure to things is in school. Um, and we have to think about uh, the opportunities, especially now that we've cut a lot of field trips out. But um, that's why the neighborhood is so great. Um, but these, these are really immersive experiences and can be really influential for a long time um, on kids' academics, even if we did nothing more than visit. So think about that. So here's one of the examples I did in the book. Um, we, you look for tracks. So if you are near some water or some place where there's like mud or some softer sand, you can look for animal tracks and they don't have to be super wild animals. They really could be any animals. It could be a pigeon. It could be a dog. It doesn't really matter. What we want them to do is um, be really keen observers and think about like what happened here? What was this animal doing? What was this animal? Look at the toes, the claws, are there webbed feet? Um, the size, are they mammals? Are they birds? What, what was going on? What direction are they going? Where do you think they 
you were going to? Um, how can they tell? What clues do they see? Um, were they going fast or slow? And then they can write about it. Um, they can write it as like, like a factual thing. Like, I think it was going here, blah, 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 blah. They can also like make it up. You know, they can use the real facts and kind of make something up that's really funny or exciting. Or, you know, there was a, a troll chasing the deer. And so he sped up on his way to go to the water. I mean, it could go anywhere. And that's kind of the fun of it. Um, and then we often do an extension. If there are good tracks in a loose gravel like this, you can pour plaster of Paris in and make track casts. And kids love to do this. And you can bring them back to the classroom um, to look at and have. Um, that can be fun. And then finally, flower geometry. And this is great in the spring because everyone loves flowers. Kids love flowers. There's something magical about them. But rarely do we link geometry with flowers. Um, so we have some wild strawberry, pentagon, five um, flowers. Uh, flowers in the rose family, plants in the rose family always have five petals. Um, and they're also good for counting by fives. Um, and then mustard family is four um, petals. Um, so they make a square or a rectangle. Daffodils um, make a hexagon. They have six petals. And depending on how you think about a trillium, you can have three. Um, you could count those as six. So um, they all make different shapes. You can draw those shapes. You can think of them as, um, you know, a daffodil is a hexagon shape. And how many different shapes can we find? Um, you can link it with um, identification of plant families. And then you can also do multiples and skip counting or addition and a multiplication. And you can see my daffodil example down here where they did um, the whole six multiplication table. Um, you could also do, I'm going to add a strawberry plant to a daffodil plant, five plus six is 11, and they could draw that or they can write it out um, and do different problems that way. So that is how I like to use flowers. And you can do that in a park or a neighborhood if you have a lot of flowers. Some do, so some don't. So think about that. But that is the end of my information. If you are looking for more in-depth information that tells you more how to do this in a group and et cetera, in a classroom, most of this is in my book and it's available for pre-order. And I have a little freebie for people if you pre-order because pre-orders are very important to books. I didn't realize this, but that's what tells um, stores and publishers what people want to have. And so if we pre-order, we're sending the message that outdoor learning is important and we want more resources in them. Um, and I made 85 outdoor writing prompts because I don't know about you, but when I'm trying to think of a writing prompt, I can't think of a good one. Um, and so I organized them by the same uh, zones of accessibility. So there's uh, writing prompts with the schoolyard, the neighborhood, and farther afield. So depending on where you are, you can just flip and pick. And all you do to get one of those is send me your receipt and I will email them to you. And the book comes out on April 18th. So um, it's time for you to think about some questions for me. And if you want to learn more about me, you can go to my website at discoverwildlearning.com. Um, I'm also on Instagram and Facebook at discover wild learning. And um, I'd love it if you followed me. I post lots of videos about how to do different things. Um, my adventures with my kids. Um, I homeschool one. I used to homeschool both of them. One tried school this year and is loving it. He's in seventh grade. So, um, and then you can also email me. I'm always up for an email. I love um, hearing from people, especially teachers. And you can email me at rachel at discoverwildlearning.com. So I 